Welcome to Jewish Boy Calls His Mother. I'm your host, Sadia. This is my mother, Ima. Hey, Ima. Hello, my sweetness. Right now, I'm stirring some, um, I got this Israeli tea. It's, um, what's it, lemongrass, citrus tea. And I also got this um, Israeli honey, uh, pure honey here. Nice. So I heard, I learned that when you add, mm, when you add honey, the tea or anything you should use you shouldn't use a regular metal spoon because oh it yeah you want to say it destroys like the natural enzymes that are in the honey i think i think yeah i think i've heard about that so i'm using chopsticks i i also heard that you could use honey to put on wounds yeah yeah i've heard that don't go outside <laughs> well no i i i went I have bees I, chasing you i went to a um I went to a like class for first aid, CPR, and AED, um, mm -hmm. and they were talking about different methods of stuff to do and things like that. And I also had you know Dr. Austin give a whole lecture as well, so I listened to that. But you were telling me you were talking about um, shoot, we just had this conversation earlier today about, about oh, doing doing papers, doing research papers for you. Yeah, kids. doing. <laughs> Parents doing research papers for their kids. Yes. Helping their kids do research papers. Yes. Yes. So um there was the whole MISA with um one of your sisters did a um her assignment was to read this um book that was what's it called? F fictional it was um you know it's where they where they have historical facts. The historical facts are are accurate but they embellish it with like a side story that's mm -hmm. made up what is it called historical fiction yes i believe right so she was doing this book this historical fiction book about a small town in the northern part of the eastern shore of maryland during the war of 1812 that had um been able to thwart a british attack by they were able to find out about it in advance and there were two things they had they only had one cannon to defend themselves so what they did was they took a bunch of lanterns and they hung these lanterns on the trees and then they left they like i think they escaped the town and hid out in the woods in another part of the woods and the british were thrown off because they saw the lanterns in the distance and assumed that that was where the town was located, not knowing that it's just a bunch of lanterns and no one's there. And also to, um, it, to yeah, oh, cat. cat. Oh, man. Just to shoo, shoo, shoo her away. Beat it, animal. You're on my bad side anyway. She scratched me a couple times today. Oh, no. How so? What happened? Oh, it was this morning. I had to go to work. I was, I was about to go to work. I was, you know, running kind of late and she wanted to climb up my back or something and she just jumped on me to climb and when they want to climb yeah. they want to just yeah. they use their claws mm -hmm. and I was wearing three layers of clothing her claws went through all three layers did you clip her nails I'm going to get them clipped next week Yeah, that's I wanted to get them clipped this week but they couldn't fit me in mm. getting clipped next week but oh my gosh, and I didn't have time, you know, I hope it didn't break the skin that was, let's put it this way, it was a, in a part of my anatomy that I couldn't exactly reach too easily. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so usually when she calls me, I have to put, you you have to put peroxide on it right away. Oh, wow. To avoid, you know, staph infection. Cats cats can carry a staph in their claws because they use the litter, bo the litter box. Yeah. So I'm hoping I'll be okay. You'll and be I'm... fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. I believe so anyway, in so you. What happened, so what happens in the story is there was a man in the town who said, just give me, find me every single piece of scrap metal you can possibly get a hold of. Bring it to me. Put it right here. I'll be by the cannon. And I'm just going to keep feeding all this metal into the cannon and blowing it at the Brit, you know, firing it at the British with all the scrap metal. And that's what the townspeople did. Um, 
I don't know when the railroad was invented, but evidently there were some like metal tracks or something they were able to get a hold of and they were able to, you know, pull them up from the ground and whatever was metal, whatever metal things they had, they just brought to him. So the townspeople were able to escape and he held off the British for hours, just, you know, blasting them with all the scrap pieces of metal. The British never imagined because he was doing it so quick that it was just one cannon with one person. They imagined, oh my goodness, the, you know, the American army must be there. And finally, after holding them off for a long time, which gave the townspeople time to totally escape, the British finally were able to catch up to where he was and to their shock, saw it was just one man feeding all these pieces of scrap metal into the cannon. Unfortunately, um, it did not end well for him. Uh, he sacrificed his life for the rest of the people in the in the village. Um, so I wanted so um, my your sister was trying to re her assignment was to research the historical validity behind this particular book that she was reading, and she's going through all these history books, and I am too, and we don't see the problem with these history books is that for some reason they concentrate a lot on um, on the role that the New York area had in holding off the British. They barely mention anything about Maryland, about Fort McHenry, and the Battle of Fort McHenry, the Battle of Baltimore, was the deciding battle that actually, that actually caused the British to lose the War of 1812, but for some reason, History books, most history books don't focus on that. So I decided to call an American history professor at Townsend. I called, you know, this American history professor, and he verified what I found. He said, unfortunately, he says all his, he says he was very, he was hard, his, he, as, as much as he tried to do research on this part of history involving Maryland and the Battle of Baltimore, he said he could, he found almost nothing. He said he verified what I found that all the history books concentrate on New York. So I didn't know what to do. And I thought, and I thought, and then I had an idea. I decided to call the visitor center of this particular town. It was, and it was, that town was still there in um, the Northern part of the Eastern shore. I forgot the name of it. And I decided to call the visitor center there. The man who answered the phone told me that, he doesn't know all the details, uh, historical details of that particular battle, but he knows someone who does. He says there's a state trooper who was born and raised there and whose ancestry goes way back, like right to the Battle of 1812. His ancestors were there. He says, I'll give you his number. And I called the state trooper. He was really happy to talk to me because, and he had a lot of information and he told me about he verified the whole that the details about the lanterns and the man who defended who basically defended the whole town, giving them time to escape by manning that one cannon. That was one hundred percent totally true. I, I love that because that whole story about how you did research, like back in the day, like I also remember doing that kind of research for you know, to, like I did a research report for a tsunami or for a hammerhead shark or like Pancho Villa. And like, I had to go to the library, take out a bunch of books, read through the books, figure out what's going on, write things down. And it was just mm -hmm. such a longer process where like nowadays you could pump out a report like that in like five, 10 minutes. Right. Well, I remember in high school when we would, in high school and college, when I would do research reports, I would go, I would, inevitably come home with a ton of books and note cards you took note cards and you had to go through the books and you had to read them and skim through them you had to find the information you had to write it down on note cards in fact there were some my teacher in high school before we would write the report would actually grade us on our note cards oh, we wow. had to show her our note cards and she would grade us on our note cards so um there was one time I was 
a lot of times when I would work on these research projects, there were two beds in my room. By that time, my oldest, when I was in college, my oldest sister was married down to the house. Mm -hmm. So my younger sister took her bedroom and I took, and you know, I kept, I kept my bedroom that I usually, that I, I had shared with my older sister. And, but she was now out of the house. No, no, my older sister had the middle bedroom. That's right. I shared, I shared my bedroom with my younger sister. So what I did was, um, there was one night I was working very late on some reports and I would go through these books and just throw them on one of my, on one of the beds. Usually I would throw them on the bed that my younger sister used to sleep on, which was now vacant. And I would sleep in my bed, which was by the door. My younger sister's bed was by the window. So I would just, I would, you know, take these books, throw them on my, I'd throw, you know, the, throw my younger sister's bed. But tonight, the particular night, I changed my mind. I decided I just threw them on my bed. And I was up and up and up and just going through these books. And as I was finished with them, just throwing them on my bed, throwing them on bed. And finally, I was, it was, I was very tired. I'd finished um, all my research. And by the way, in those days, most of your time was on the research. Writing the report was very quick because yeah. you would you you just went through your note cards and just filled in, just filled in the paragraphs. You know, it was it was, it was just English writing. So I go and I sleep on my younger sister's bed. Now, it was my younger sister and I used to prank each other, and one of the pranks I pulled on her, which was really horrible. I mean, I really regret it. It was wrong. But, you know, teenagers are teenagers. They have no mercy. I would wake her up in the middle of the night, tell her, hurry up, hurry up, you're late for school. <laughs> and so her girl would go to the bathroom all of a sudden, yell, yeah. <laughs> So she decided to prank me back one night. This was the night that I had thrown all my books on my bed and decided to sleep on her old bed. I'm laying in her bed. I'm falling asleep. I hear the door open and she goes, oh, Charlene. And I go, yeah. All of a sudden I hear, Banzai! And I crash. <laughs> I turn on the light. There's my younger sister in the middle of all those books and the bed is falling down. <laughs> she says, she thought she was going to jump on me and wake me up in the middle of the night. I wasn't there. I was, she, she she jumped on the books and the whole bed came crashing down with the books on it and her on top of it. I love that story. You know why? We talked about this like earlier on, like the beginning of our of our episodes or a podcast. And like, it's just, it's just so funny because you take so much revel in the story of how much your sister screwed up because you're like, I beat you. You try to get me and I got you back. <laughs> oh gosh. I, I can't. You know, I mean, it was, it was. Yeah. I know it yeah, was teen, terrible. Teenage, teenage, you know, teenagers are teenagers. And they you weren't a teenager. You were in college. You know? Um, College kids do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh I I think I like when I was in college and like we had uh we it wasn't college, it was like high school, maybe mm -hmm. early college. And um it was when the TV show Jackass was out. Do you remember that yeah. TV show? <laughs> I saw it a couple times. Yeah, it was so about, thought, about guys that what they try to prank each other or they, they do yeah. stupid things. <laughs> so we would we had it took turns shooting each other in the butt with a BB gun. So that 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 stupid kid stupid is a stupid does like <laughs> dumb things you know what's funny is i actually have that video like on facebook like on my personal <laughs> video i think it's mine or or it's one of my friends ha still has it um mm -hmm. but i'm trying to think of other like stupid stuff i mean i did plenty of stupid stuff i mean when i, when I was <laughs> in kids, israel you know? when i when i was in israel i liked going on top of this one um this one building on the roof and just look at the 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 view you'd you'd see the hotel you'd see the dome of the rock you'd see you know higher zaysim and all this stuff and just like especially when it comes to like end of the day where it's just like you hear the call to prayer you hear everyone rushing for mincha you start seeing everything else like it's just really beautiful and um to get there though uh i had to climb around uh, a a gated door 
with mm-hmm. a 60 foot drop <laughs> and I would climb yeah. over it all the time where <gasps> if I let go for a second, I was dead. How did you do that? How did you climb over that gate? You, you, you held on. <laughs> so, so the way it was, uh-huh. the, way, the way it was done was you have the, the door and then right next to the door, you have the, the wall with the 60 foot drop. And what I would do is I, I would go around like this to the other side with the 60 foot drop over here. So oh, I think I'm trying to picture. Is that, where's that located? So if you, I don't want to, I don't want to give too much extra information. I'm sorry. I can't, okay. I can't tell you where it is, but maybe I afterwards, because I don't want people to go ahead and hear this and then see if they know what's going on and try to do it themselves. <laughs> I don't want to like, whatever. It, it's my little story. It's my little secret. Um, Oh, what, what, what's, what, what's she doing? The cat is now biting my back. What? Because oh, she loves you. Oh, I see it. Okay, you be, so behave cute. yourself out. <laughs> really, really cute kitty. Um, but Until she bites you. Yeah. Well, I mean, you probably rally her, rally, roll her up. Most I likely. I am not rallying her up. Well, there, well, I have two cats and they've never bit me. So I'm just saying, mm. how you raise them, dear. Mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, but I'm trying to think. Like, like I remember also, like when I was a teenager. I mean, I don't know. I would like. I actually was a decent kid. I wasn't too crazy. I mean, I did get suspended a lot because, like, <laughs> I'd get into like fights with kids and whatnot. But. Never. It's it's it, you live and learn. You it's just like there's no tolerance anymore for violence in schools, which is ironic because there's more school shootings now than ever before. So, <laughs> like, what are you doing? What are you trying to teach them? Like, there's there's a major flaw in that logic. Um, but I'm trying to think, pranks. I don't think we'd ever. I'd pull pranks with Yosef if I did anything, um, like that. But yeah, I think I'm getting distracted. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I added to what you're saying about, about the reports and about the historical fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that like when I was a, like when I was a kid, you would have like you know Encyclopedia Britannica, and you'd go through mm-hmm. it. And what's funny is that like I remember going through things, and then knowing that it wasn't true, you know, like. Like you remember, like reading about Einstein, and they they wouldn't mention mm-hmm. that he was Jewish. Mm-hmm. You know, a German scientist. Yeah. They they would all do all these little subtle things, mm-hmm. and like nowadays, this is so freaking psychotic. The um, pro Hamas uh, people, whatever, they're now trying to claim that Yashka was Palestinian and that he was Muslim, and it's just like, oh, did you? Oh, did you see that? <laughs> That thing that was it you sent that to me that that was it was that Saturday Night Live? That wasn't Saturday Night Live. What, what was that, that was? That was the um, that was the Saturday Night Live of Israel. That was funny. It, I thought it was funny. It that wasn't like was it wasn't hilarious. Ha ha ha! In my but it was, opinion, it was funny. But it was entertaining. It was. Yeah. I would say it was definitely entertaining. But it's 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 getting to this point where it's just like. Like the evidence is right in your face and you're doing nothing about it. Like you're denying the evidence in your face and you're just ignoring Mm -hmm. everything else. And it's just like, you can't even argue with these people or have a conversation. They don't want it. Mm -hmm. They just want to yell and scream and shout. Like right now there's these, these, these pro Hamas um, rioters with the Palestinian flags uh, out uh, right, uh, right outside the world trade center. Like today, right now Mm -hmm. blocking everyone from, from exiting. It's like they're a bunch of wild animals preventing like anyone to just do anything. They they also were blocking the uh, main highway to LAX and the main highway to JFK, mm-hmm. and they're getting arrested and they're gonna be they get to have all this martyrdom where it's like, oh, I got arrested, but I'm I'm fighting for human rights. You're like, you said nothing on October seventh when people were being when when children were being beheaded and thrown into ovens, and women were getting and men actually too were getting mm-hmm. raped. Like, mm-hmm. what is wrong with you? Mm-hmm. And it's it's frustrating because it's just like 
you 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 wanted to shake them. You really just want to just get there, but you can't do anything about it. Like there's nothing there's nothing you can do. You can't like try mm-hmm. to educate them. They don't want to be educated. You can't mm-hmm. tell them they're wrong. They don't think they're wrong. Like they just don't care. And what's worse are the capos like we talked about last week. Ooh. You know? And it's just like you're disgusting. But you know, there's there's nothing you can do. There's that except Davin and whatever. It's just it's it's I don't know. I was here's why I'm I'm getting pit, a, a little upset because like I'm mm-hmm. I'm on Instagram and Reddit and all these places and I just see just the 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 tons and tons of these videos of people just being so blatantly anti-Semitic and ignorant and then then like then like fall back and play the victim as if like that's gonna save them. You're like, was it this bad during the six day war, Yom Kippur war? No. Ab- no, actually not. It was in fact people people were afraid people were very pro-Israel. Interesting. For the most part. There was because you had all six Arab nations that were blatantly that had blatantly um announced that they were all going to get together and push Israel into the sea, that this was going to be it. All six Arab nations together ganged up on Israel all at once from the from all around the entire borders, all the borders. And Israel, the thing is that Israel totally beat the pants off of them in just six days. It was an open miracle. And people were just totally amazed. The only thing that did happen was the United Nations Security Council called an emergency meeting. And um, the ambassador from Israel, they the Arab nations were claiming that that Israel started it, that um, Israel was the aggressor. And the ambassador was being interviewed by, I think one of the news people. I remember him saying, talking about how small of a country Israel, you know, is basically. And he, he gave the dimension, he goes, this is the entire size of our entire country. And they're saying, we're the aggressors. And then he ends by saying, what abominable nonsense. And then Ibn Ezra came to the um, Security Council meeting and he's, his, his speech was quite, the way he spoke was quite moving. They said, um, in fact, one of the news commentators said that Ibn Ezra's um, powers of persuasion are known to be legendary. Um, the United States representative was a Jewish man. Oh God, I, I see his face in front of me. Forgot Adam Gold, not Adam Goldberg. I forgot his name, but um, he had to call a recess. Uh, he said for personal reasons, and um, the truth was he had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and so the one of the Arab representatives um, started to. Um, accuse him of trying to waylay the proceedings because he was Jewish. And I think the guy was named Fred Goldberg. I forgot the guy's name. And he called the Arab representative obtuse. I mean, tempers were really flying during, it was a television, you could see it was on television because it was a, a totally televised session of the you know, UN Security Council. And boy, and they were not getting along. They were, there was verbal attacks back and forth and back and forth. But I think one of the things that um, Israel by totally, you know, totally repelling such an unbelievable attack within just six days, uh, people were extremely, everybody, everybody just loved Israel. It was like, it was like, wow. It was like, everybody was pro-Israel. Everybody was, you know, just, just amored of the way that Israel just did this. And that was when the co- that was when they were able to take back um, East Jerusalem and liberate the Kotel. That's, and um, I think also well, one of the things too that is, like I said, doing, taking care of the war quickly 
I think helped a lot. Whereas what's going on now is, you know, it's, it's, it's dragging, you know, well, you know, and the, it's, and the, dragging the way, on it's dragging on, but you know something, when you t think about wars in general, um, most wars, I mean, World War II, but it actually started like in 1939, the United States didn't enter until two years later. So basically we're involved, we were involved in World War II for about three and a half, four years, roughly. Um, Revolutionary War lasted a long time because then you had the War of 1812, so it wasn't really totally finished. You know, I think Revolutionary War went like for about 13 years or so. Civil War was about what, four years? Civil War was about four years. Yeah. 1868. So really, you know, the idea of having a war that's going to be, you know, finished within like one week is, um, that's very unusual. That's that's not um, that doesn't that doesn't really fulfill the you know the, the run of history. Well, there's there's a few things I wanted to mention. One was do do you do you know what Yair Lapid said a couple of days ago? What I'm sorry, who said Yair Lapid? I'm the sorry, who was that? He's the opposition leader. Um, in sorry, in Israel. Mm -hmm. I'm not and the most Israeli politics. So he said that he said that Israel wasn't made so anti. I'm trying. I'm trying to make sure I don't ruin this quote. I'm trying to make sure I don't don't ruin this quote. Um, but as I'm looking, I also wanted to say that it's very frustrating. Um, it's very frustrating knowing that we had Gush Katif, knowing that we had Gaza in 2005. We gave it for so-called bullshit peace. It yes. blew up in all of our faces. We knew it was going to blow up in all of our faces. We still went through with it. Now we're going to have to go ahead and just wipe out Gaza and now deal with all the repercussions and bullshit that it is now. And if this was 2005, like we have to stop apologizing for ourselves and apologizing for who we are. And that's what really bothers me a lot. And it comes to right. Israeli and Jewish politics. The, a, a lot of people have felt that way for a long, for a long time. And when they when they gave back Kush Katif, it was like everyone knew. And even there were even Goisha news analysts that got on the air and said, "This is a tremendous blunder. Israel shouldn't do this." I mean, everyone knew. Everyone, everyone knew what was going to happen. Oh, so I found the quote. So mm -hmm. Yair Lapid said the state of Israel wasn't founded with the belief that anti-Semitism will disappear. It was founded so that we can tell anti-Semites they can screw themselves. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that that's mm -hmm. that's that's the quote. But that's what like like that's what we need to do. I'm I'm the one thing I like about what's happening now, I mm -hmm. am seeing a lot of anti-Semitism. But what I am seeing also is a lot of Jewish pride in a way mm -hmm. of like, I'm proudful to keep Shabbos. I'm prideful mm -hmm. to keep cautious. I'm prideful to cover my head, to, you know, to wear my yarmulke, to wear tzitzis, to learn Torah and mitzvos. You know, like it's, it's such a, it's such a, I won't say it like this, pardon the expression, but it's such a holy war, you know, of. I think, I think it's woken up. It's had the opposite effect, maybe what our, of what our enemies thought it would have. Instead of, you know, Jews hiding and cowering, we're doing the exact opposite. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're standing up for us. We're standing up and we're proud to be Jewish. And um, we're not messing around. We're not. Yeah. I think I think the, that you were talking about how the, the this war is dragging on. But the reason why it's dragging on is because mm -hmm. it's pushing off the inevitable. I remember speaking to Yosef and a few other people and mm -hmm. asked them, like, what's the end goal? Like, what is everyone doing? You know, mm -hmm. and they're both doing a chip away and they're just chipping away and chipping away until something breaks. And now something's broken. Saudi Arabia um, mm -hmm. just made a, a, a comment um, telling the Palestinian Authority that they have to disband, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's another thing too. I think that um, 
you have Arab countries that are also afraid of Hamas because they they know they're gonna you know Hamas is gonna is gonna is coming after them too. They're not it's, just gonna be content with Israel. It's so ridiculous. Um, but because... what what gets me is that like with Gush Katif, you know, in, in Gaza, that I remember how sad that was that um. The as a matter of fact, the uh, member at the time, the head of the IDF, um, resigned rather than carry out the orders of pushing people out of Gush Katif. And I remember um, Ariel Sharon was the one that you know that uh, the, that was involved in the steal. And oh, it sounds like um. It's like all this suffering. Yeah. It's now, it's very you, frustrating. You, you, you fill in the blanks. I mean, he was the one. I mean, he he could have not given in. And um, I remember the, we said before about you know, the Kubalist in Israel at the time, who's after they signed the agreement and after Irish run ordered the evacuation of Gush Katif, that you know, there we go. That he said Ariel Sharon had gone the way from which he could never do Teshuva. And it was shortly after that that Ariel Sharon had his stroke and for five years was um was in that was in that coma. Yeah. It's it did. It, it, it's. It's. I remember when Gush Katif was happening, and like it just rattled my brain of like how stupid this was, and it the was damage it's going to cause. And sure enough, the damage was there, and it's. Mm -hmm. It bothers me, but it's just like nothing I can do about it. So I have to not care because that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what I've noticed in my lifetime. That if I go ahead and I care about something, someone tells me that I shouldn't care about it because it's not my problem or it's not a, not mm -hmm. it's a non-issue. You know. The thing is, too, it's like when you see something like that, the feeling of helplessness. You know, you you can call the Israeli embassy. You can let them know your opinion. You can call your elected officials. But how, how much in a situation happen? like that, how much how much is it going to affect? Yeah. The, and and, you, and everyone saw it coming. I mean, um, there was, oh, by the way, I was listening to, um, I, I forgot the man's name. Uh, he was, he's on the, he was substituting for one of the news commentators here in Florida. Yeah. And he said he had a very good friend who was somebody that's kind of a high up in the IDF who was letting him in on some very interesting information. And that is the reason that the um that the Hamas terrorists were unfortunately so successful. Evidently Israel in a goodwill gesture to Gaza, permitted workers to come in from Gaza. You heard about that one? Yeah. Yeah. And work yeah. in Israel. And some of them, many of them worked in construction. Mm -hmm. And many of them worked in construction in this particular area of where the yep. Kibbutzim were. That's... And that's how they knew exactly where people lived, exactly where the safe houses were, where the safe rooms were. And a lot of these a lot of these terrorists were actually had have been employees that have worked the Palestinians, there. from what I'm understanding, the Palestinians inside Gaza, every single one of them is in cahoots with Hamas. And every single one of them sold out all those Jew friends of theirs that brought them in with their liberal dumb ideology. And they got fucked. And that's what happened. And that was going down because these dumb liberal cucks thought it was a good idea to let in these terrorists into their homes and give them a map of what was going on and all this information and they use it to rape them kill them butcher their children kidnap their children kidnap the men women and all that and you know what it's because these dumb liberal pieces of shit think that oh if i go ahead and i make peace with you you'll make peace with me they will never make peace with you they do not care they want you dead and you'll never get that through your head never 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 and that's what's well, so disgusting that, and that's what's so frustrating but they said the joke about what is a what is a conservative? It's a liberal who hasn't been mugged yet. <laughs> and I think I think so. I think a lot of liberals have been mugged. 
a lot of Jews on the left are leaning more towards the right because of how disgusting the left is, how anti-Semitic the left is, and how much ridiculousness this is. I am so sick of seeing all these Jewish liberal leftists trying to legitimize why October 7th happened and, and why it was... It's just, it's aggravating and it's you, disgusting. How can you legitimize something so tragic? Because they're capos. They're nothing but disgusting capos. That's what they are. They're nothing but worthless capos. Well, I was I was watching um, on YouTube. It showed um, these Jewish women talking at this um, women's forum. Um, and one of the women was a young woman. And she said she was, she had been a very big liberal. She said she was part of the Black Lives Matter you know, movement. She was part of the Me Too movement. A um, couple other, like, very um, liberal leftist um, organ women's organizations. And she said she was so hurt when all this started with October 7th to see her non-Jewish liberal friends in these movements that she had been so dedicated to totally turn on her. They don't care about us. They never will. And they just, people have to get over themselves. It's like people have this whole, Jews have this whole idea, especially, in my opinion, especially leftist Jews have this idea of like, if I act like you, you'll like me. If I do, if I wear the same clothing as you, you'll like me. Can't you want you want to be my friend? Is it possible? <laughs> oh my gosh. And you're like, you have no idea. These, these <laughs> people don't care about you. They never have and they never will. I'm I'm impressed when, when, when a non-Jew actually cares about me. I'd be impressed. They don't. Our blood is cheap to everyone. We have to defend ourselves. We have to work on ourselves. It's ridiculous. And it's sad and disgusting and frustrating. And that that's what gets to me with everything that's going on. I'm really seeing it with my own eyes really seeing it you know like steven spielberg has, is gonna try to make this whole thing happen like about october 7th into a film i don't know if that's gonna make a difference whatever we're running out of time um <laughs> i love you let's try, let's try to end on a happy note okay uh have a wonderful shabbos might as well uh, be happy because guess what what are we gonna be able to do about it yeah yeah say yeah. lovey Da da David, you know, say David and strengthen our mitzvahs. Mm -hmm. It's like you know. That's all you can do. Everything you can do. Yeah. Don't worry. Right. I think well, you know, the don't worry, the Jews are going to come out okay. We always will. Well, it's the, what the damage is going to be. Mm -hmm. But the que the question is, what's going to, you know, I think the rest of the world should be uh, should be concerned about themselves.